Welcome to the Financial Coaches Podcast, where we talk about how to build your practice from startup to scale up, while being the kind of coach your clients crave. Finally, a podcast for financial coaches. Here are your hosts, Maria Casillas and Cody Sizemore. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Financial Coaches Podcast. My name is Maria Casillas. I'm joined here not only by my incredible co-host, Cody Sizemore, but also by a very special guest who we are excited to have an amazing conversation with today. Bill Nelson has joined us today. He is a longtime listener of the podcast. He reached out to us a few months ago and said, hey, I have some really incredible stuff I think that your audience would benefit from. We absolutely agree with that and are pleasure to have him on our show today. Bill, welcome to the Financial Coaches Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Okay. So just as an overall topic, one of the things that we want to talk today about is the millennial couple because that is who Bill works with primarily. And Bill, you have a pretty cool story as to how that happened. It sounds very similar to a lot of the stories of how we all got into the the niche that we're working with. But would you go ahead and share that with our audience, please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm a certified financial planner. I'm a certified financial therapist. And I got started on my own back in 2016. And um, as I was making that transition, I really envisioned working with uh, millennials like myself and student loan planning and kind of all the financial topics you, you typically think of when you think of younger generations. Uh, but right a- along the way, I had actually gotten married myself about a month before starting my company. So I, I went through and I-, I quit my job, got married and started a company in about 60 days, which um, as a sidebar, I don't recommend doing all that at once. It was a little bit, it was a little bit much. Yeah, a lot of but, change. You know, a lot of change. <laughs> yeah, but but I, I found as I was going through the, this transition that you know, I not only was I at the stage where I was learning to manage money with somebody else for the first time, right? I had my own ways of doing things, certainly as a finance person going into the marriage. But you know, married somebody who was very much in sync with, but we had different attitudes and perspectives and, and values around money. Um, at the same time my income went to zero when I started my company. And, and, you know, obviously there was a lot of stress and anxiety that, that went into that. And just figuring out how do we chart this right path forward in the context of all of our other goals was, 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 was tough, right? You know, like it was something that I lived. And then a lot of my, my early clients back in the day were in that sort of engaged and newlywed stage as well. And I was seeing that play out Um, among the couples I work with, right, in terms of getting on the same page of managing budgets and combining accounts, or even just kind of the bigger, broader goals, right? Where are we going to plan our roots as a family, right? If, you know, like, how should we be thinking about balancing careers and maybe one person leaving a job to be a stay-at-home parent? And I just, I I saw a lot of that play out as I was kind of figuring it out on my own for, for myself as well. And you know, one thing led to another, and I just I, I went further and further down the the research rabbit hole in terms of figuring out how to help couples get on the same page. And um, I, I've really focused a lot of my work on that ever since. Mm. Wonderful. Now, one thing I did not mention in the intro was uh, that that you were actually focused on newlyweds and engaged couples. So, is that I know that's where you got in. Is that still where your focus tends to be? It, it, it is. I, I find okay. that um, the, the couples who come to me these days either are in that stage or they say something to me, something along the lines of money is the only thing we ever fight about. Right. Mm. And so, w- w- you know, they may have been married for years or even decades at this point, but, you know, really trying to figure out how, like still trying to figure out how do we actually combine um, things and, and manage money in a way that actually strengthens our relationship rather than um, weakens it. And so, um, you know, what, wh- wh- whether engaged and newlywed is a, is a true life stage or just kind of like the, the spirit of where we're at. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I do a little bit of both. Yeah, that's a great distinction. And I really appreciate that. I think that that's the way you just said that the spirit of where they are. It's like, you're doing the stuff that they could have or should have done in the engagement process or in the newlywed process. And since they didn't, now it's still a, a sore spot for them. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, okay. and you know, I, I don't like to, uh, you know, I, I think it, that money is one of those things that right, very few of us learn how to manage on our own to begin with, never mind with somebody else. And I just, I, the more I've seen of pre-marriage counseling and things like that, like some programs do a lot better job at um, addressing that than others. So I, I think it, it's, a, um, it, it's a tough thing for, for couples to learn sometimes. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. So, Bill, um, this is actually a topic that I 
love. Uh, you know, I like, I, I love helping millennials, of course, like that's, you know, I'm a millennial myself and, um, you know, they have a special place in my heart, but I really, really love helping people who are couples and millennials. Um, cause I think there's just so much potential that can be unlocked, not just with the finances, but also just like their overall relationship, which affects not just their relationship, but also their kids and stuff like that. And like y'all, you know, everything, it can like really leave a really big ripple effect. Um, but I will say that I also have a frustration with this topic and I'm curious to see if you have the same frustration too. Um, so with me, I help singles. I help couples. I'm not like, you know, married to, I'm only doing couples. I'm only doing singles kind of thing. Um, so a lot of the times someone will book a call with me and they are married but they have their finances separate than their than their spouse or they're married and they're just like I handle the the money because we have so many fights they don't even like take a part in it and I feel alone but it's you know I I don't want to do this blah, blah blah and a lot of the times I'm actually met with uh with um uh what's the word I'm looking for um, resistance resistance thank you maria i met with resistance on it, even having like them on the same call at the same time right so i'm just kind of curious like am i the only one who experiences that or do you experience that too because i even put in like my application for when people book calls with me i'm like if you are married i require <laughs> that the other person is present and even sometimes still they're like oh, well, don't worry. Like I handle this. Right. And mm -hmm. I get really frustrated with that. So do you experience that too? Uh, a, a little bit, right? There's a lot, there was a lot in there. Certainly I, back in 2017, like I vividly, vividly remember um, having a call with, with a guy. Um, I call him Doug. His name isn't Doug, but I call him Doug. Sure. Um, sure. And he, you know, he books the call with me, right. He told me he was married in the, in the email he sent me and it was just him show up. And I had never had that happen mm -hmm. before. And I, and I remember, asking him like just almost offhand like it just out of curiosity is there any reason your wife isn't on the call with us today and um and, and he he kind of brushed it off and i said all right well i'll make sure i'll send the follow-up email to 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 both of you and he kind of paused and, he, and then he turned to me and said like look you know bill i'll be honest i just mentioned to you i had thirty thousand dollars in credit card debt she doesn't know about it and i'm embarrassed to to tell her about it like that that's mm -hmm. why she's not there um and that was kind of the moment where i realized that you know, I like, I'm a financial planner. I like my spreadsheets. I like my calculators, I like my numbers. Like there was no spreadsheet that was going to solve that, that particular problem. Right. Um, it, it is a very common thing, right? It, it is, a, it is a common thing, certainly to have in the millennial generation, um, for couples to keep separate finances, right? Like, that, to me, that's one thing, but where I, where I get stuck is it sounds kind of similar to, to your experience as well. Um, like both people do need to be involved in, in, in the process because there, there, there's no way for one spouse to out earn, out save, et cetera, right? What the other spouse is doing, right? You, you, you don't literally need to split things equally or, or divide up the financial responsibilities in a way where you each are executing some of the tasks yourselves. But it's really important for couples, right? For the, for just their long term future in general to be aware of what's happening, right? To be in agreement on where we want our money to be taking us as a couple. I, I, I do think that that that's a pretty, um, pretty important thing. And, and in general, right, to get back to the financial coaching piece of it, I also think it's really important for both, both people to be comfortable working with the coach or the planner that you're working with. Like I, I actually, I, I will kind of take first calls with people who, just one person is showing up for whatever reason, but, but I will not move forward until I meet with, with the second person as well. And I, and I do think that sometimes having that initial call as a way to kind of break the ice and kind of understand where the couple is at can kind of help me figure out the, the right way to move forward with it. But uh, yeah, I, I, I do think it's important that um, both spouses participate in some capacity, right? Now, that being said, right, I, I actually don't have a big issue with one, uh, one spouse taking the lead on executing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the day to day, week to week, month to month financial tasks, as long as the other spouse is in the loop, right, is is being involved in the actual decision making process and can find all the things that they need to if they ever had to. Yeah, yeah, and, and I agree with you on that uh, as well. Like you know, 
some some people just have that natural strength with it and, and others don't, you know, and sometimes they're married to each other, you know, so um, I totally agree in that. Uh, with all that being said, Bill, I mean, how would you address having that conversation with someone to where like you are trying to, you know, tell them like, hey, like, I know that you've been operating this way for a while for this reason or that reason. Um, but there's a lot of benefits to working together as a team, right? Like, um, cause sometimes like for, for people, we're never taught about money, you know, like we don't know like what to do. We don't know what's the best setup or anything like that. So oftentimes you may be the first person to even say that to them, you know, mm -hmm. that's like, Hey, this is actually a good idea to work as a team here kind of thing. Um, but if there is that resistance with, uh, with someone who's maybe just been operating this way for the last 10, 15 years, how do you think that you can kind of speak to them to get them to not just like, can, to be convinced to drag their partner to this next call, but to be inspired to bring this partner to the next call and, and then, um, you know, really come together as a team? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the first question that I would ask myself in that scenario is, where is the bottleneck, right? Where is the resistance? Is the spouse that's meeting with you not interested in including the other spouse for, for whatever reason, or doesn't think it's important to, in which case I can have a conversation with that person to um, try to understand a little bit more of that perspective and try to guide them to um, what might be a, a more optimal outcome, right? In the future, or is it the other person isn't interested, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that the way you handle those couple things I think, I think is important, right? We, I always look at communication patterns in, in a relationship, right? It, it is the problem um, in a scenario where it's the other spouse that just doesn't want to be involved and is happy to delegate it to the person who's on the call with you um, is the problem in the way the spouse is asking them to join, or is it like something that, that, that that's on the other person's end, right? Trying to get, get to the root cause and understand where the holdup is. Um, and, and letting that kind of dictate your next step, I think is important. Yeah. Yeah. So, so asking more questions, right? Asking more questions is, is, is often my answer to most problems that I face yeah. um, <laughs> in, in, you know, when, 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 whenever I'm working with somebody. And, and yeah. you know, I, I also think that don't be afraid to ask for some sort of um, micro win, so to speak, right? You know, we, we don't need to get to the point where, We've we've never talked about money successfully and everything separate, and neither one of us has any any clue what the other is going on. Like we don't need to go from that to completely joining bank accounts mm -hmm. overnight, right? Well, right? What's the next step we can take um, in, in the right direction? And um, oftentimes, I find that kind of looking forward rather than looking backward is the best way to do that, right? What what do we want our lives to look like ten years from now or twenty years from now? Um, your spouse won't talk, answer that question with you, right? There, there's a bigger problem at play than, than financial mm -hmm. pieces, right? In, in, in my opinion. Um, and then from there, like, okay, great. We're talking about our future together. Now we kind of reverse engineer, like, how do we actually make these things that we want to have happen a reality? What do we need to be doing? Um, and yeah. and us, using that as a way to, to get into the um, details of the current financial status. Yeah. So, so when you say micro wins, um, because I agree with you, like, you know, if someone's been operating a certain way for so long, like asking to change everything, it's, it's a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think that what you're saying here is like, Hey, like, let's take things one step at a time and let's focus on not getting everything perfect, but more so of just like building a foundation for you guys. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, you know, and I'm going to go off the topic of, you know, the resistance side of things, but more so bring it more of to like the general. Uh, side of things of like, hey, if you do have a married couple or or an engaged couple or a newlywed couple, and they're trying to get those foundations in place for uniting their finances, um, what have you found to be the most helpful for people? Um, Either do or to know. Sorry, so I'll say that last part one more time. Uh, what have you found to be the most helpful for people when building that foundation to either do or to know? Yeah. Um, to, to me, uh, it actually gets back to what, to what I just mentioned, right? I, I think that the way that couples can really use their, like build a really strong financial foundation for themselves often involves looking to the future, right? Getting clear mm -hmm. on 
what we want our future to look like as a family, right? What, where, where do we want to be? What do we want to have accomplished 10, 20, 30 years from now? Because um, I find that oftentimes, even for couples who, who disagree on some of the financial stuff, like, usually that long-term vision is very similar, you know, mm-hmm. like just in, in terms of the, 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 the types of people that we attract, right? Most couples want the same thing out of their lives in the long run. They might just disagree on how to get there. And so I think mm. that you know, g- getting really clear on um, what it is we're building toward first and foremost, and then from there, dialing it back and say, okay, great. Like, that's where we want to go. Here's where we are today. Like, what are the next couple steps we should be taking, right, to, to set ourselves up to be on that trajectory? Um, I yeah. love that you just said that because for a few reasons, Maria, we've talked about vision work and finding, like, the bigger why behind everything, right, like several times mm-hmm. on this podcast. And, and this is just, you know, reaffirming that, right? Mm-hmm. Um but I love the idea of actually starting big, you know, like what's the big vision and then kind of like zeroing it in. So it's almost like a, I was trying to think of like a visual aspect when you were talking about how I can actually like picture this being. And it's like, Hey, if you're, if you're trying to capture something, so if you're trying to capture like this, this ultimate life that you want with your spouse, right. Um, think of it almost like a lasso, like a cowboy you know, like at a rodeo, like he's got this lasso, right? And it's like a big, like circle rope thing. And you like cast that out. And then once it actually goes around what you want, you pull on it and then it starts to shrink. And then it gets very, very specific. And then you can reel it in kind of thing, right? That's just what was going through my head. But I really love that you're starting big and then working towards the smaller stuff to reel it in of what you really want. I love that. Yeah, that's great. I, I, I love the lasso analogy as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's cool. So I've been trying really hard to be quiet for the last five minutes. Um, <laughs> I think I've done a pretty good job of yeah, it, actually. Yeah, I uh, agree. <laughs> uh, but but I, I know, I know. Uh, but I have been taking a few notes because there's so many things that I want to be able to go back to say, and I'm notorious for forgetting those things. Um, so if I feel like I'm going backwards, that's, that's the only reason. <laughs> I don't know, Bill, if you've listened to anything that we've talked about in the last, I don't know, probably a few months, but I'm a, a pretty recent homeschooler. And because of that, I've had to just learn a, a, just a whole different way of teaching my children. And one of the most important things for us is to be able to define things, understanding what words mean before we actually use them in any sort of context. And uh, one of the things that I that just stuck out to me is that when you said, um, you know, we want to go back to uh, what we're building towards, it's like we need to define why why money is is the root of some of those causes or some of the fights that people have. You also mentioned at one point, you know, there's no spreadsheet that can address that particular problem. And I think that's because numbers are just a reflection of something else. And in my experience with anyone I've worked with, it's always been, I could almost do an equal sign that says money equals values. And it's, it's because it's just like this direct reflection of what each individual in the couple values. And then, you know, we bring two people together to make one entity. And it's like, now we have the family values as well, right? The couples of the, mm-hmm. va- the values of the couple, excuse me. And so if we're looking at that, especially with the lasso analogy, which is really cool, it's not just the idea of what do you want to accomplish 10 to 30 years from now. And I know that that was thrown out there, but then you, you wrapped that up beautifully with what do we want to be building towards? And I think if we as couples are able to see what do we want our lives to reflect, what values are super important to us, then we can actually start to get on the same page with some of that. And it, the other thing it kind of feels a little disjointed, but I'm going to throw it out there also, is that whole idea of the financial infidelity that you were alluding to. It's like, it's because the reason that there was embarrassment and shame around that is because that individual knew that that wasn't serving his wife well. Mm -hmm. And, and so just kind of being lost in that, well, I'm now I'm embarrassed and I don't want her to know, but I think at the core, he really does want her to know, but he wants help from somebody else to help share that and, and figure out like, why does that 
why does it bother him? And can you help, you know, mm -hmm. um, to support that? So that's just all of the things that I wanted to say in that moment, because I just, I, it seems like we're doing such amazing work and so little of it really is around any of the numbers. That's mm -hmm. just a reflection of so many bigger things. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yep. Well, thank you for letting me throw all that mm -hmm. up after not talking for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am curious, if I may ask, you mentioned that while you were kind of doing all this, you were newlywed and that you and your wife are very similarly yoked in terms of what those values were and stuff. What Was there anything that kind of shocked you about the way that she thought about money or that she behaved with money that you're like, oh, well, this might be a little bit more of a thing to get over than I thought it would have been? Maybe the answer is no. Yeah, you know, I it, it's a good question, right? I my, my wife's a primary care physician. We got married while she was in residency, making a, a relatively low income at the time, working 80, 85, 90 hours a week. Wow. Um, and so, uh, uh, frankly, a lot of the day to day financial stuff, we just we didn't have that much time to talk mm -hmm. about, right? Mm -hmm. Over the course of, um, you know, when we got married, like we always kind of knew we wanted to combine all our accounts, like a, a lot of the the, the, the decision making in that sense was was pretty easy for us. What what was a little harder was for us was more some of the what I what I sometimes call like the financial adjacent type topics, right? Not literally the dollars and cents in the bank yes. account, but how do we think about balancing career decisions between the two of us, right? You know, we we she for those of you who aren't familiar with the the, the residency match program that the doctors go through, right? You but you literally you know rank you know. 10, 15, 20 different places you might want to work and all these places rank their applicants and you get matched to one of them, right? There, there, there's not a, there's not a choice that you make, right? And so going through that um, process together was pretty tough, right? From on my end, I had a career um, that was pretty well established in a very particular part of the country that, you know, I, I was going to be looking for a different job at the time, you know, if we didn't end up drawing the right number out of the hat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um and then we moved to a place that I didn't particularly care for all that much. Um, won't name any names, but, um, you know, just, it, it was kind of a tough transition for me. And that was just as I was getting my firm started. And so I kind of built it to be flexible and just so trying to figure out where we were going to settle down and where we were going to move to and how to think about different job offers that came through like that. That was the piece that we had the most, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that, that we had the hardest time with. And yet the foundation for a lot of those decisions probably was what your values were individually and as a couple. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I think, you know, it, it, we got to a point where we took a step back and kind of made a list of what those things were. And um, that helped us kind of narrow down to a few options pretty, pretty easily from there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, like I, I almost think about it like a company having a mission statement, so to speak, right? The couple bullet points they have that guide mm -hmm. financial decision making like if, if you take the time to develop something like that when you're faced with an unexpected decision or a crisis or, or whatever it is like you've taken the time to do that work you can pull out the paper and that should be a north star to kind of guide your decision making yeah um, yeah so maybe instead of a mission statement like a company would do you can do a value statement as a couple and exactly. yep. and and use that in order to make some of those, not just financial decisions, but I like how you described it as financial adjacent decisions as well. I think that's a really powerful tool that our coaches listening today could actually start to implement right away with the couples that they're working with. Yeah, love it. Mm -hmm. I do have one question I've been kind of uh, teetering on. Um, it's, it's kind of like a more like just straight up direct question, Bill. <laughs> okay, um, great. So what do you think is the biggest challenge that newlyweds or, you know, uh, just married couples who are combining their finances for the first time? Um, what do you think the biggest challenge is for them? And then furthermore, once that challenge is over, has been overcame, what, what's your favorite part or their favorite result from that mm. as well? I know it's kind of a big question, but I think it's really, really important. Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the second part of that first, if that's okay, right? Absolutely. I, I find that when we are able to work through those roadblocks, right, what I have seen is that all of a sudden, right, we're not just making financial progress um, in working through the financial questions, but like, marriages are actually getting stronger yes. in, in the process, right? So often about the, the way that we as an industry talk about money and marriage tends to be pretty negative, right? Money is one of the most common things that couples fight about money 
Fights are a leading indicator of divorce. Money fights early in a marriage are actually more predictable, like like are, are more in line with future divorces than money fights later in a marriage. Um, mm. right? that there, there's all all these statistics that are out there that show the the negative impact of this. What we never talk about is what happens if the if we flip it on its head, right? If we can actually learn how to get on the same page and manage money in a way that works for both of our, our money values, like marriages actually get stronger in, in the process. And so that, that that to me is definitely my favorite outcome here. Yeah. Um, in in terms of the biggest roadblocks that I see, um, generally speaking, it's like what is holding a couple back from working together financially. Right. Mm-hmm. What, what I mean that that's like the worst answer to that question uh, imaginable. I know I'll give a few examples of what, what I'm what, what I'm getting at. Um, I, I've seen a number of cases recently um, where one couple is really hesitant to just like combine accounts or even start the process because they've seen um, their friends go through messy breakups and like the 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 husband leaves and drains the bank account in the process it's like mm-hmm. and there are legal rem- re- remedies for some of these things but they're not instant right and so um I, I, I one case i saw last year really stands out where like the the wife basically said you know like i'm willing to combine everything if i if i can keep $20,000 in the same as account separate right just just because it's there because i've seen three of my friends have these issues like if i, if I can keep that separate and like you can keep some money separate as well. Like then, then we can, then we can do that. Right. Like, and, and there, there's a lot of things that go into that sort of um, resistance, but by, by identifying what, what was holding her back, right. They were able to then combine everything else. And it, it was a pretty good, pretty good mm-hmm. outcome. The, 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 end, the end result is they essentially just kept their emergency fund separate and, and combined, combined everything else. Um, and then the other one that comes to mind is debt. Right, couples that enter marriages with debt, particularly if one person has the majority or all of the debt, um, mm-hmm. that's really, really tough for for couples to work through. Like that, that that is probably the the biggest one I see in terms of the the, the kind of a specific financial issue that can hold couples back. Yeah, yeah. Um, I find it interesting. I didn't know that this statistic was true until you actually said it. That the likelihood of like divorce happening goes way up if if the couple has money issues early on as mm-hmm. compared to later on you know um I, I would have never have guessed that personally i mean now that you say it i think it makes sense mm-hmm. <laughs> you know um but it, why do you think that that is like you know what's the difference if it's money issues at first or money issues later yeah, I I don't have a good answer for that unfortunately because I I I picked that up from a financial conflict resolution class I took last year and <laughs> okay. um that, that was like I, I don't remember exactly how the, the the instructor had the like the language in the study that was conducted that showed this and I I basically asked her why why she thought that was and she looked at me and said yeah literally nobody knows no nobody <laughs> understands why that's the case but it is something that they found in the huh. research so so if I put my homeschool mom hat on for a second, <laughs> I, I would say, why do we think that that might be the case? If we had to come up with some sort of logical explanation, mm-hmm. what, what would that be? Yeah, I, I think that just in general, um, I, I, I've seen pre-marriage counselors talk about quote unquote eggshell issues that couples have, right? Where like, you know, you, you bring up an issue and it's like you're you're trying to tiptoe around the eggshells so you're not stepping on them. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if I got that metaphor right, but like I, uh, oftentimes couples have one or two or, or three or thorny issues right when they when they get married that are just the, that are hard for them to overcome. Um, right, that, that that is very typical in the, in the couples that I talk to, and I think that some of the scars from those early conflicts I think can stick with us. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that there's some unresolved issue that... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's not even necessarily unresolved, though, I think, right? If okay. I, um, if I, like, injure my... Like, I, I'm, like, I'm trying to think of a good, like... Analogy? Like, a, like a, 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 a not, like, too gross analogy. Like, if I slice... <laughs> if, if I slice my arm open on something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that day, it's going to hurt a lot. Right. And it's mm-hmm. going to have bandages on it. Like there's going to be a lot of things we need to do to treat that acute injury. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. 
as time goes on, it's going to start to heal. Uh, but but there's going to be a scar there. Mm-hmm. And if I want that to fade, right, like once the bandages come off, once the actual wound heals, I might put sunscreen on it to keep it from burning to hopefully make it fade more. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert in skincare, right? but, mm-hmm. but, but, but the, like it, it might actually hurt, right? If, if I have a scar, like it might not just hurt if I'm like just hanging around doing nothing, but if I actually push on it a little bit, it might sting mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. for, for a while. Right. And eventually, right. These things fade, right. But the, the mark is still there. And I, I think that uh, conflict in couples is, is similar in that way, right. In the moment, gotcha. Right, it's not going to take much for, for to feel the pain from whatever it is we're we're fighting about. But as we move on, as we work through it, as there's healing involved, right, day to day might be fine. But if you really push on that issue again, like it might start to to hurt, mm-hmm. uh, even years after the fact, um, and, and even down the road, right, it might not be an issue anymore. But like if you if you look at it, if you think about it, like you'll you'll it's still there, right? That reminder of uh, of the conflict will still be there. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Maria. Okay. I was just going to say, I think it also might come down to the whole money equals values. It, it is a reflection of what things are. So if indeed there was some, something that injured us, you know, oftentimes emotionally, psychologically, uh, and then whatever the, the money conflict is, if it was, it, for example, if we had infidelity in past relationships and this person that we have now is super, super faithful to us, but is hiding this $20,000 on a credit card, for example, mm-hmm. that could be that reminder of, okay, this is, it's not even about the money at this point. It's about the infidelity. And that is bringing up these old things and that's not yet um, been resolved. And so it, the reason I would say that it's probably more an indicator of divorce early, early on is because if you have more of these issues early on, that's an indicator that the values are a lot less aligned yeah. and that would then lead to divorce later on. Whereas if it takes, you know, 10 years for you to start to get into some of the messy, um, the, fu- the messy financial stuff, that might be just more a, a victim of circumstance at that point, you know, mm-hmm. and now we're just trying to figure out some of the, the, the strategies around how to deal with that. And it's a lot less of an emotional condition that we're that we're dealing with so i don't know what your thoughts are on that but that would be one of the as i'm thinking through some of that maybe that's an explanation as to why yeah i I think it absolutely i think it absolutely could be yeah Uh, you kind of took the words out of my mouth maria so okay well you're welcome Uh, (laughs) but i was was gonna go down that route of uh use the word infidelity i was gonna say trust issues right Mm -hmm. um i'm even working with a couple now to where they when they they've been married for 15 years i think 16 years something like that but when we had our first meeting you know i always like to talk about like you know their relationship with money first before they actually jump into the numbers and stuff like that and one of the things that had came up was that the husband was like crazy with money like just spending it spending it spending it racking up credit card debt credit card debt credit card debt And that really affected the wife so much so that 16 years later, she still feels like she has a hard time trusting him. So Mm -hmm. so she's been like very controlling of the finances and stuff like that. Um, So I I think that that makes a lot of sense because it is when it's early on, like, and you have those wounds, like you mentioned, like, you know, the the gash in the arm kind of thing. um, It does leave those scars. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to work through. Is it impossible? No, but it's difficult, you mm-hmm. know? So I think that that makes a lot of sense. It's the trust issues. It's the infidelity issues. It's the scarring. It's it's all of that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 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 Well, and it requires a newfound way of communicating, right? It requires forgiveness. It requires um, it, just asking for forgiveness, reconciliation. There's so many things that are required in order for that to happen. And if, if our couples don't have the communication skills to make that happen, that's going to be a huge barrier for them as well. Yeah. So, Bill, we just want to say thank you so much for your time today. Honestly, like, you know, it was a really good conversation and a really, really important conversation as well. Um, one that I think we need to put more focus on, to be honest with you, because it's it's what really does build not just strong marriages, not just strong families, but also strong, strong communities, because it all starts with, with the family unit, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I really, really appreciate that. Um, I do have just one closing question for you, man. Okay. If you're talking to the new coach, 
who maybe has like, you know, a, a client or two under their belt, or maybe they're trying to get their first client and, it, you know, they're talking to a married couple or maybe a newlywed or an engaged couple or whatever it might be. What's your biggest suggestion for them? Or what's the biggest thing that you want them to just know, um, you know, about the journey that, that they're about to embark with these new clients? Yeah, you bet. Um, so, so two things um, that, I'll, that I'll throw out there. First and foremost is just understand. Um, I, I think it's it's so important whenever we get into working with couples to understand like where your boundaries should be, right? A, a, as a professional, right? Um, like the financial infidelity stuff that we talked about, right? Just recognizing that that's a really serious problem that couples face, right? And, yeah. and can lead to really bad outcomes if it's not handled uh, correctly. Um, any sort of like financial control issues, right? Where like one person's cutting off access to money, right? That kind of thing that, that to me is an automatic, like we want to get somebody else involved to make sure that the person's you know, get, getting the care that they need. Um, right. So just like, I, I, I've seen a few cases before where, you know, like I, somebody's reached out to me or another planner who I know, and, you know, saying like my husband told me that I need to get my financial issues under control and he's cut out our access to, to my credit cards until mm-hmm. I do. So can you help me with that? Like that, um, like that, that's actually something that we would classify as financial abuse, right? Which is a right. really important thing to make sure is handled correctly, right? So don't like, don't give that person budgeting help, right? That person needs to be in touch with a marriage counselor or, or some other sort of uh, person to, to, to really help with that issue. So that, that, that's the kind of, Glass half empty right? answer to the question, right? Mm-hmm. Understand what the warning signs are, right? And, and, and handling them correctly. I mean, beyond that, though, um, of a, with, to kind of get to a more positive answer, um, don't, don't be afraid to ask one more question always, right? Like I, I have very rarely um, regretted asking a, a follow-up question when, when I'm coaching a couple, right? If, if we feel like you're, like you're almost at kind of the root cause of what the issue is, right? Don't, don't be afraid to say, tell me a little bit more about that one more time. Um, cause right. I, I like that often is where the, the things that have had the most impact re- really, um, really have come from. And, 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 and always remember, right. That, um, you know, we want to meet the couple where they're at. Uh, you know, you might, you might know what the right or wrong answer is in a situation, but, um, I, I understand that, right. It, it may be a process to get there sometimes and, and, and that's okay. Right. That, that, that is, that is okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Peeling back those layers with mm-hmm. those questionings, right? Yeah. Very, very important, especially for the, the newer slash like getting started coaches, uh, super important to know. So, yeah, man. Um, it was awesome to have you, man. Loved it. Great episode. Lots of value. Um, can you just share where people can find you if they ever want to, you know, get in touch or maybe even re- refer someone to you or ask questions, you know, like on anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I am most easily found on Instagram. I'm at Pace Setter Planning on Instagram, which is my company's, um, which is my company's name. Obviously, my website's PaceSetterPlanning.com. Um, I wrote a book for uh, on couples and money uh, back in 2022. Mm. Um, it's called, called marriage centered money, get on the same financial page and achieve your life goals together. Um, so you, you can get that at marriage centered money.com as well. And, um, and then my, my email, if people are interested in reaching out is bill at paysetterplanning.com. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Make sure you connect with bill, buy his book. I'm sure it's great. I'm going to check it out too. So bill, if you want to shoot me a direct link, that'd be awesome. Cause I Will definitely do. love this kind of topic. So yeah, man. Um, well, thanks again, and uh, thank you for all the listeners as well, um, especially those of you who have been checking in every single week. We love to, you know, to call you guys our every weekers, and uh, we just love and appreciate you. Um, if you haven't yet, get connected with our Facebook gr- uh, group. It's uh, The Financial Coaches Community by New Money Habits, and uh, you know, start a conversation there, ask some questions, and um, you know, learn from some awesome like-minded coaches. So. Thanks again for checking out this episode this week, and we'll catch you at the next episode next week. Thank you for listening to the Financial Coaches Podcast, brought to you by New Money Habits and Sizemore Financial Coaching. Submit your questions to our hosts by emailing podcast at newmoneyhabits.com. Be sure to subscribe to be notified of future episodes and join our growing group of like-minded coaches on Facebook. And until next time, Happy coaching.
Music provided by Summer School.